In 1928, a 25-year-old Dane arrived in the town to set up his own business and he brought with him 30 bales of Danish bacon. Sophus Crow Nielsen rented the front room of a house on Pollitt Street where he stayed for four years. His English was limited and he had limited funds but he set about finding customers as far away as Nottingham and Manchester. His granddaughter, Nina Stobart, still has the warehouse on King Edward Street. He came over on the butter boat with 30 bales of bacon, um, ready to earn his fortune, or try and earn his fortune, but at a time where the country was in depression, it wasn't probably as easy as he thought. He took his first office, which was on Pollitt Street, which is now the main entrance to Grimsby Docks, and he worked on his bike, by the train, any means he could, travelling around to try and get customers. The warehouse may not now house bacon, but it still remains in the family. The business ran until the 90s when it was sold. He opened the warehouse in King Edward Street and they were selling Danish provisions through to butchers and he originally sold bacon and cheeses and also butter. He then progressed and they opened another warehouse in Hull and also had offices in Manchester and London. Sophus was a hard-working, tenacious man. His father was a farmer in Ars in the Himmeland region of Denmark. He was extremely distinguished. He was tall, he was elegant, he was somebody uh, I always looked up to, obviously he was my grandfather, but everybody did. Everybody I spoke to at the time when I worked here in the school summer holidays and people that still come up to me and, and ask, are you Nina, Nina Nielsen, was your grandfather Sophus? And they always reel off lots of amazing fond memories of him. And it's just, I'm proud, I'm proud to be his granddaughter uh, and I'm proud to say I'm part of the family. 50% of the British market in 1964 was commandeered by imports of Danish bacon, of which Sophus was a major player. The warehouse in Grimsby was a hive of activity, with bacon being smoked on site and cheese and butter being produced. At home, Sophus was a family man. He'd married Josephine and they had a family who followed him into the family business. As with most families of Scandinavian descent, customs were kept alive. Uh, he married Josephine, um, my grandmother Ninny, who was obviously English, and we still did do a lot of Danish things. Obviously on King Edward Street at the bottom there's the Danish mission, and we used to go there quite often for meals and at Christmas, the traditional singing around the Christmas tree and the smorgasbord. So we did enjoy Danish traditions, and we still have many things in the house that, that remind me of my Danish um, history, including uh, little things like Copenhagen... Uh, China and also we have some beautiful Danish spoons that were gifted to my grandmother. During the Second World War, Sophus was a keen donator to the Grimsby Fund to buy a Spitfire. Throughout his life, he was a benevolent man who gave much to charity. Uh, Denmark were a neutral country, so he obviously couldn't sign up to help Britain, which was his, his homeland now. So instead, he fundraised and sponsored Spitfires, which was his contribution to the war. And when Hell got blitzed very heavily during the war, it was his lorries that were the first in, taking bread and provisions back into the city. The warehouses in King Edward Street were extremely lucky and didn't get bombed through the war, and then unfortunately um, were taken by a fire after the war. And then all the people I guess he helped came out to help him, and the provisions were stored in all the, the businesses that he worked with while he rebuilt his own business back up. He was a remarkable man. I, I struggle for words, which for anyone that knows me is something that I don't struggle for when trying to describe him. He was the first to help everybody, both in charity, neighbours, anybody in need. He was just a true gentleman and, and a great person to know. He was active in the company until his death in 1990 at the age of 89 when his son and daughter stepped in. Uh, the business continued after my grandfather died and my mum Wendy Nielsen ran it with her brother and 
it was a, a time of change. Industry was changing. The Danish government uh, was changing. Um, importing, whereas originally he was one of two people that imported from Denmark. So, um, if you like, the money had gone out of bacon. So the business was sold, uh, which was quite sad. It was the end of an era. I sort of thought that maybe one day I'd be able to work and, and, and take over after my mother. Um, I had many summer holidays at college where I'd come back in and, you know, all my business CV was I was an expert in bacon and cheeses. <laughs> but it was a fabulous time with fabulous people. While the business may no longer be in operation, the legacy of Nielsen still survives and many more Scandinavians are coming over attracted to the region for its prime position in the country. Why are Scandinavians being attracted to the Humber region? Difficult question because I was born here into a, a Scandinavian family. Um, it's a fabulous region. Obviously, the gateway into here um, with the docks is probably one of the primary reasons through fishing. And as my grandfather came through on the, the Danish butter boats, um, it's just, it's a wonderful place. And it's somewhere that you, you know, you look on the map and we're actually not that far away. Um, why? I don't know. I'm just glad they did. From food production to farming, words and expressions are seen to have connections to the Nordic dialect. Uh, my family were... Well, one side were farmers and the other side were farm labourers. And so they they actually used a farming dialect. Now, my dad, uh, we had... Well, he had coos and coughs. He didn't have cows and calves. And in actual fact, if you look, those words coo and cough are very close to the way that they're pronounced in the Scandinavian languages. And he had gimmers. Now, as far as I know, that's not in the Queen's English. But a gimmer was a yo lamb, a young, a young lamb. And the Danish? Gimmer. My dad's were gimmers. The Danes had gimmers. Not a coincidence, I don't think. When they got a bit bigger, because a gimmer wouldn't, because they weren't very heavy, they were only little. But when they got older, or heavy in lamb, particularly in Lincolnshire, you know, we had Lincolnshire long wool sheep, they got very heavy, and sometimes, unfortunately, they would get rig welted. Now, that is not a standard English word. It's not in the Queen's English of today. But rig welted was what he meant when... It, they would get in a grip, in a, a little dip in the field and turn over with their feet in the air and they couldn't get up again. Now, if we look at the Scandinavian language, we find that rigor is the backbone and velter is to throw. So my dad's sheep were rig welted, thrown on their backbone. Hmm. Not, on, not only were his, did he have rig-welted sheep, he had cade lambs as well. A cade lamb, as you probably know, was a young lamb recently born and, unfortunately, either the mother would die or uh, it wouldn't accept its young lamb. And so that young lamb would have to be fed with a bottle. And we call that a cade or a cady. Uh, the Scandinavian word for a young animal? Ked. Ked. Cade. Ked. Very similar. Mm -hmm.